Okay, so this is the chapter on contemporizing the Christian message, which is uh, chapter two in Erickson Light. One of the questions we've got is the fact that the Bible is like 2,000 years old, and the newest part of it, and some of it's a lot older than that. How can an ancient book talk to us today? I mean, like the world has changed uh, since that day, and it was done in kind of rural context, and now we're in big cities, and uh, then a big city was a few thousand people, and now a few thousand people is like a village. How do we relate ancient Bible to today's world? Uh, so what we talk about in this chapter two is contemporizing the Christian message. So we're asking the question, how is it that we take what's old and bring it up? And there are different ways of doing about that. Uh, one of the ways of doing that is uh, what we just call transplanting it, which is we take that and just bring it up today, and there it is, and no changes at all, get used to it, do the old kind of things. Uh, problem with that is there's stuff that just doesn't work. Uh, when it talks about, uh, for example, that you need to give the land back to its original owner after 49 years, I mean, what does that mean today? I mean, it just, it's a whole different situation. It doesn't transplant well. Another picture is what we call transforming, which is we just take the ancient worldview and all that stuff that doesn't make sense today, we just drop it. Uh, a third view is what I'd like to suggest what's in the book, and that's that we, tr we, we translate, uh, which we take what is there and bring it up so that things are made sense in current terms. Uh, some examples. Uh, how do we find out what's there? Uh, well, lambs, for example. I have never had a lamb in my house, ever. Uh, but your lambs are really big in scripture. So how do I understand lambs? What happens if I'm in a place like Indonesia where there are no lambs? Uh, and how do I translate the concept of lamb into contemporary society? Well, some people, kind of the transformer sort, are saying, well, you know, a lamb, just use pig. Uh, well, the problem is that pig doesn't work because as a lamb is silent before its shearers kind of thing, well, Pigs are never silent. You get near them and they start squealing. So the symbol doesn't work. So something like that, and when we contemporize it, lamb is a symbol, is a, is a biblical symbol, so we have to understand a biblical language for it. And I think we have to learn some of those kinds of things. Uh, so some things like lamb, uh, we just have to, we have to translate that and so people can understand lamb. Another thing, uh, demon. Uh, in my world, uh, almost nobody believes in demons. Uh, if I go down here on the street outside my house and I start asking people about demons, they all look like I'm crazy because they think demons are just pre-scientific exclamations of psychosis. So a transformer is going to drop demon and put in epilepsy in the place of that. But when I look at that, I think demons are something that are very real and they're still around today. Many parts of the world, of course, believe in demons explicitly. I've seen demons. I've worked with them. I don't see them with my eyes, but I've seen their impact in people's lives, and I see people be free from that. So that's what we need to do is translate and bring a biblical concept into contemporary language, but we've got to keep what is originally there. We've got to keep the doctrine that's there, even if we change some of the symbolism or something like that. Uh, so let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, marriage. Uh, scripture is really clear, Genesis to all through the New Testament, that marriage is one man, one woman, husband and wife for life. Uh, I think we have to maintain that. I really do. But when I think, okay, wedding. Well, there are weddings in the Bible. Uh, do we have to follow a biblical pattern of wedding? Uh, and the difference is when I look at marriage, that's something that's there from Genesis clear through to Revelation, really. And so the marriage is a doctrine we have to keep, but wedding is something it pictures at here and there, and it gives us an example of stuff. But I don't think we have to follow the wedding custom. 
even though we follow the marriage doctrine. So that's some of what we see in terms of translation. Uh, how do I see the difference between those two? Uh, in the end of like five epistles, Paul tells us to greet one another with a holy kiss. And I don't greet people with holy kisses here in the United States. Now, if I'm in Lebanon, I do. It's three kisses in the air beside the cheek uh, with women, uh, not so much with men. Uh, I'm t I saw when I was in Ukraine that the pastor had a birthday, and the chairman of the deacons came over and made a big deal of his birthday, and they exchanged a very warm mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss. I was thinking, okay, that may be a holy kiss, and it was, but um, that's not going to work for me. So how do you do with that? Greet one with a holy kiss. How do you, is that something we need to learn to do in our contemporizing the biblical message, or is that something that's cultural and time-bound and we can leave behind? Well, how do you tell the difference between those two? Um, and the kind of principles that are helpful is that in Bible, it's a constancy over cultures. So greet one with a holy kiss, where is that happening? Well, it's happening in a particular culture that Paul's writing into, the Greco-Roman culture. We don't find that side of thing exemplified, say, in the Jewish culture. So right there is a clue that this is something that's, uh, that's culture-bound and we can greet one another warmly, but not necessarily with a holy kiss, the constants of our cultures. Another is the over... Uh, universal settings. Is it done as a universal kind of thing or is it done in a particular context? And the holy kiss is an example of something that's in a particular context. Uh, I think of something like baptism, which is a way in the New Testament of expressing and confirming the reality that I'm a Jesus follower. And that is done in the end of Matthew chapter 28 as a universal kind of thing. Go into all the world and baptized, so it's a universal culture in the original thing because go into all the world and do that. Uh, in John 13, Jesus tells us about doing foot washing. So he washes the disciples' feet, something that only the lowest slave would do, and he said, you go and do likewise. Does he mean that we should wash other people's feet? Well, if you look at that in the original, this is the only time that fush washing is done, and it's done in a particular context where he as master and lord is serving the people that he is master and lord over. And when he says, do this, the doctrine is, when you're a leader, you should serve the people you're with. The particular act of foot washing is a one-time thing. It's not a universal setting. So that's the kind of way you do that. Uh, another thing that is in the scripture itself, there's a recognized permanence. And there are many things in scripture that are recognized that are done in a particular setting and for a particular time. There are others that are done permanently. Baptism would be an example of that. Uh, another would be when you come into new land, what kind of recognition do you give the gods of that land? And the answer is very simple. You do not recognize the gods of the land at all. You worship and serve Yahweh, Jesus only. Uh, is there a, a link? Uh, Boltmann, for example, tried to get resurrection of Jesus out because it's a one-time thing and it's hard to believe. So he said, let's just leave that behind. But you can't separate resurrection from the work of Jesus Christ. You can't separate resurrection from the hope that we have of that newness of life. So that doesn't work. And then Finally, there are things that are uh, they're placed in a progressive revelation. And as we move to new things, some of the old things go out of example. For a good example of that would be sacrifice in the temple. If we're in a Jewish economy, uh, I would go to the temple morning and evening for the sacrifice. I would go to the Day of Atonement. The whole nation would gather together uh, and the sacrifices would be made. But we don't do sacrifices today. Why is that? Because Jesus is the final sacrifice that ends what those sacrifices were pointing to. So I don't do blood sacrifices today at all. Uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to push pause right now, and I want you to get your Bible, and I want you to turn to Galatians 3.16. Okay? 
So to do that, I'm going to do it right here, Galatians 3.16. Uh, have you got it? Galatians 3.16. Uh, it talks about promises are spoken to Abraham here and to his descendants, talking about the, the descendant. And this descendant, uh, or the seed, depending on your translation, the offspring, uh, is Christ. Now, the promise came to Abraham, but then in verse 17, it says the law, which came 430 years later. Now, that law is the law that was given to Moses, Moses at Mount Sinai. So we've got Abraham, 430 years later, we get the law given to Moses. So the law is added to, this is verse 19, why then the law? Why then Moses, we've got Abraham, Moses, Moses is, verse 19, is added to promise uh, because of transgression, because of the sin, until the offspring comes. Okay, now stop and think with me a minute. I know it's a little complicated. You've got Abraham, and you've got the promises given to him, and you've got the way of life given to him. So he is loyal to God. He is trusting in God's way. He is doing righteousness and justice. He's looking for provision and Messiah. And then added to that is the Mosaic Covenant with its sacrifices, its uh, food laws, that sort of thing. And the mosaic is added to the Abrahamic. Now this again, verse 19, it was added because of sin, I think, to help people keep Abraham during the period of Moses. But then key word there, until the offspring who should come to whom the promise has been made. So what that tells me is you've got the Abrahamic covenant that doesn't change, and you've got the mosaic that's added to it until... Jesus comes. So what does it say about Mosaic law today? It says, I think, that we're not under the Mosaic covenant, though there's much in the Mosaic law that's wise to be followed. So we take the Mosaic covenant, and we as Gentiles in the church are not a part of that because Mose uh, Messiah has come. And that's a key thing, because when you look in the Mosaic law, there's a whole lot of stuff there's stuff about if you're going to divorce somebody, you can do that. Just write him a certificate of divorce and you know let the woman go. Well, that's a concession to sin that was given for a period of time, and we're not under that anymore. Uh, there's, uh, the idea now is, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that husbands and wives should be married forever. Uh, and this is in Matthew 19 where that question comes up. Moses is added to Abraham until... So that's why I don't do sacrifices today. That's why I don't do follow the food laws today, is because those things were originally given as temporary kinds of things. Now, this is not easy. But I think the key here is understanding, you know, what is given in a permanent context, what is doctrinal truth that's foundational for all cultures and all times, and what is it that is given to us that comes connected to uh, the revelation of Messiah Jesus. And when we contemporize, we translate ancient stuff into contemporary ways it can be done. So one more example, uh, one of the big words in scripture is the word propitiation. I'll bet you haven't used that in the past week, unless you're in church maybe. Propitiation, uh, 1 John 2.2, 2, uh, for example, is the idea that I make a sacrifice to satisfy the wrath of somebody uh, so they're not mad at me anymore. Now, how do I contemporize that into today's world? Because that word propitiation doesn't mean anything today. And I think what we do, because the doctrine of a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath so that his wrath passes over us, you recognize the Passover symbolism there, that is an important doctrine. So what we do is we talk about, and we use examples today, where uh, we make an offering. I mean, kind of a silly example is, I do something that makes my pretty wife mad. And, uh, you know, what do I do about that? Well, I mean, in kind of a silly thing, I bring her flowers to give her an offering <laughs> to satisfy her wrath. Now, that's not God's way. But understanding how that concept of propitiation can be made relevant to today's world 
and then help people understand why is God so angry at sin? Well, think of a kid being brutalized. Does that make you mad? We just had a situation here where a guy that was high on drugs passed around two parked cars, threw a crossing lane, and mowed down a 15-year-old girl right in front of her mom. And if it doesn't make you mad that this guy just craziness killed a beautiful young woman, so what do you do with wrath? Because our sin, which hurts people, causes pain, brings wrath, that concept is a universal concept. And what we have in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is a way where the Father and the Son partner together to make that sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of the Father and the Son so that the wrath passes over us who accept his sacrifice. That concept has to be there, but we have to get rid of the idea that God is just vengeful and angry and hard to deal with. So bring that into concept where we translate the concept in today's world to bring the truth and the reality of the biblical worldview. That's what we talk about when you contemporize the message. Not easy to do, but important. So study hard. Thank you.